of mine. Very good. Tonight we come to one of the most, well, there's, there's many sad chapters in the Bible. Tonight's probably one of the most saddest as far as mankind and, and what's happening in life here. Genesis 19. But there are a lot of lessons for Jesus and God to learn. The reason he writes his word today is always for us to learn something. And Genesis 19, as I look at that, at first it was a downer to me, but as I looked at it for the last time tonight, before I came to present it, the Lord gave me an upper. Now, and so, and I think you'll see it as we go along here. But Genesis 19, we're going to start with verse 1. It said, There came two angels to Sodom, and Eve, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now, why would Lot be sitting in the gate of Sodom? Because usually when you sat in a gate, you are, per, you are a person of a very prominent position. The gate to any city was a place where people would be that would have authority, they would have money, they would have a lot of things, and that's the reason they sat in the gate. They were considered wise people. And so Lot was sitting here at the gate of Sodom that even. And two angels came. And Lot, seeing them, it says here, rose up to meet him. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. Wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. So Lot was being courteous here. Anytime a new person came into a city, this is one of the things that they did. The people in the gate would invite them into their homes and show them hospitality. So this was a normal thing or something to happen for an elder whoever sat in the gate of a city. And his extension of hospitality was a normal thing here. And he said, you shall rise up early and wash your feet and go on your ways. They said, no, we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, or here another word for greatly would might be vehemently. He said, no, you're not staying in the streets tonight. There is no way you're going to stay in the streets. But he turned into him as they pressed upon him, and, he tur and they turned to him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, it says here, and did bake unleavened bread. Now, you just don't pull back in the, those days. You don't, you know, today we just pull bread, what, out of the freezer? or out of the fridge that's been keeping, or we got bread that we bought at our bakery. In France, I remember they used to call the bakeries. We do go every day when I went on a mission trip to France. In France, they call them patissiers. Or pat I probably got it wrong, if anybody. Patissier. I'm like you, do, it, uh, words are probably don't get right. But we went every morning when we was over there, and we got bread. You talk about fresh bread every day. That is good stuff. It's not good to be a carb freak, I'm telling you. But it was good. Tammy went on that trip with me. And it, pan what? Pan oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> so that was good stuff. We, we ate well over there. And uh, that was a blessed mission, missions trip over there. And so here he's going to bake them unleavened bread. Why? Because the Jews ate what? Unleavened bread. And it takes a while to bake bread, probably three, four hours. So they were probably visiting in the home. He was baking them some bread. And then they were eating. So they were having an evening supper, basically. But before they lay down, so they're getting ready to retire for the night. It says here, that we're in verse number four. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, says here, compassed, or, what, or comp another word for compassed here would be surround. So the men of Sodom came that night to Lot's house, and they went and surrounded the house. So here's these guys that are coming. They compassed the house round about, it says here, both old and young. So it tells us right there that there were men around the house that evening that were of all ages. So there were men there of all ages, young and old, all the people from every quarter. So every quarter, we knew there was people there that night around the house of Sodom that were old, they were young, they were rich, they were poor, they were middle income, from every quarter of the city. 
So something must have went in. Some word must have got out. And all of a sudden, here comes these men from every quarter of the city. So there probably was more than two guys, or three guys, or four guys. There's probably a whole bunch of people, all ages. Some young bucks, some old bucks, some guys who wanted to be in between, whatever. They were all there. So they're gathered around his house. And so, they beat on the door. Where are the men that came in unto you, it says here, which came to you this night? Bring them out to us that we might know them. Now, what do they mean by know them? Okay, most of us might interpret that in a couple different ways, but there's little problem here, okay, of their intentions that night. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail, but when men are with men, their intentions were not good that night, okay? They wanted to come out, and they wanted to do some bad things to these guys. And I'm not going to go into any detail, like I said. But they, they were pressed into the door. Later on, God tells us that what these men wanted to do that night to those two guests that came, and they were angels, we know that. Okay, but the, what they wanted to do that night, later on, if you wanted to write this down, we won't take time to go back into Scripture and look, but in Leviticus, chapter 18, in verses 22 and 29, in Leviticus 20, in verse 13, this type of, I guess I'll use the word of homosexuality, of men with men, uh, women with women, it talks about in Leviticus there, was unscriptural. And the penalty for that happening is God gave the Levitical law was stoning and death. Okay, that was the pronouncement of judgment for any man that wanted to do whatever they did with the men and women with the women. Stoning by death was later on given. So here these guys come that night. They're beating on the door and they said, bring these guys out to us. We want to know them. It says in verse 6 here, And Lot went to the door and, and shut the door after him. So Lot goes to the door, opens the door, walks outside and shuts the door. And he's standing there in front of the door. So now Lot's outside with all these guys. There's him and these guys are outside this door. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. Or another word for wickedly here, do not spoil, do not, do not mock. Because Lot, remember, where did Lot set when they came to the city in the gate? Lot was a ruler in that city. But he was not originally from Sodom. Remember when him and Abraham split up? And Abraham said to Lot, Lot, where do you want to go? He said, well, I want to go down there, a watered plain. Look at how green that plain is. So I'm going down there. So we know Lot was not an original Sodomite. Or a Gomorite, if you want to call it that. I'm called a Bathite today because I'm from Bath. So Lot was not one of those guys. But Lot was there. And he had probably come to the place either by his riches that he had, his influence, okay, um, maybe because, if you remember, there was a battle, and it was preached here a few weeks ago, remember the kings came and they carried off Lot and all his family, and they sacked that whole area, and guess who came and rescued him? Lot and his 400 men. They, they, had a, they turned a whole army. So I'm sure Lot was in pretty good standing, because at that time, I'm sure the king of Sodom and everybody else there knew that Lot was Abram's brother-in-law. Or nephew, excuse me, nephew. So he was his nephew. So Lot's here outside the door. Now he's trying to reason with these guys. So Lot sets there, Behold, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For they came under the shadow of my roof. That's a tough verse in there, and people can interpret that verse in many different ways. Lot was not being disrespectful or, or dishonoring to 
his daughters. You might say, that sounds really wicked and cruel. Yeah, it was. But Lot was not, he did not say this here because when you were a host for somebody back then, okay, Lot was willing, and that host or that, that, that person that was hosting you that night, basically you were under his protection. He was responsible for you. And Lot was willing that, and custom demanded, so this was custom. Custom demanded even Lot offer his own life if necessary to protect these two men who came under his woof. And I'm not saying here, and I will never say it, and Pastor had it in his notes, we never justify what man says or does because man is wicked and man is sinful. We all are. But Dot thought this the better of the two actions that night, and he thought he was doing right. Not so, but it, this is, it's recorded here in Scripture. It's a sad verse. Lot saw this, the lesser of two evils, basically, is what he saw. But then the men said to him, Stand back! And they said again, This fellow came to us. Now they're talking about Lot. So now the guys, now it goes from the focus of the two guys in the house. Now the focus is on Lot here. So we see the, the focus turning in these next two verses. And it said, they said, stand back. And they said again, this fella, they're talking to Lot now. This fella came into sojourn. So he's not even from our city. He came to sojourn and now he's going to be our judge. Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. So now they're turning on Lot a leader, a respected man in the city. So this shows the depravity of man. This is sunk to the lowest of the low of the low. And another word for worse there might be the word wickedly. Wickedly. Let's do unto him worse or more wicked than what we're going to do to those guys inside. And it says here, they pressed sore. So in other words, they were, they, they were getting ready to take him out, basically. They were going to do Lot in. And um, so it says they pressed sore on the man, even Lot. And they came near, so, so now they're on top of him. Don't know what they're doing to him. But they're pressing sore, and they came to take Lot and break the door down. That's what they're saying in the verse here in verse 9. It said, but the men, that's the two guys inside. So I wouldn't imagine, just like Jesus, these two angels, they were angels. Okay, these guys are no wimps. Okay, they were probably like 30 Navy SEALs at one time, maybe. I don't know. These guys are no weak, weak little guys. Okay. So it says here what happened next in verse 10. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. I imagine they were strong if they shut the door. Those boys outside weren't getting in. And Lot was in there with them. And, it said, and they smote, verse 11, and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, or what? Tells us again, both young and old. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. Now, some say here, and I'm going to take you to a verse in another situation here, the only other situation in all of Scripture that we see the same word for blindness used as the word blindness was used here. This, I found this rather interesting. In 2 Kings 6, 18 through 20, this is recorded. So when the Syrians came down to Elisha, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said this, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. Same, same term, same blindness. Okay, in the Greek and the Hebrew. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, so he, now he's saying to the guys, okay, they were struck with blindness. Because what do you think when you say the word blindness? I can't see. I can't see. Okay, it's not the same term here. Listen. He struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. 
And Elisha said to him, This is not the way, guys, nor is this the city. This ain't who you're after. Follow me. Now, you think the guys could follow Elisha to another spot if they were totally blind? Think about that. And I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. So now they, they don't know who Elisha is, and they're at the wrong place when they were told by the Syrian king to go kill that guy at that spot in that location. So the Syrians came to that location. And what happened? Elisha prayed, and they were struck with blindness. Think about this blindness here. It's the same thing that happened here in Sodom. But he led them to Samaria. So now Elisha leads them clear away from there. Now if they're totally blind, they cannot follow a guy. And you know the story. When they came to Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes that they may see. And it says, the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And there they were inside Samaria. Totally in the wrong spot. And Elisha's out of there. The men here in Sodom were struck with blindness. What were they? Here's what I think happened. They were mentally disoriented. They were not blind blind. They could not see. They could not. Why? Look at this next verse. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. They were, they could not even find the door that they were just at with Lot to drag him through it. They slammed the door. And now the, all these guys are out there and they can't find the door. Now, if I was blind, believe me, I could feel my way along and I could find a door if I was just blind. But it said here that they wearied themselves. They couldn't find the door. So what they do? They dispersed. They were gone. Can't find the door. So next, verse 12. And the men said to Lot, Hast thou any here besides? So they asked him a question. Who else is in the house? Son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever do you have in the city? Do you know anybody else where you have influence in the city? Who do you know in the city? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters. They're, they're going down the list, and they're asking him. They said, bring them out of this place. So now the men are going to reveal to Lot their real intentions for coming into the city. It says, for we will destroy this place because of the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Another word for wax in there is grown great. So, some cry somewhere, I'm not going to assume where it came from, but there was so much wickedness in that city that God had decided to destroy that and that whole area. And it says, and Lot went out. So now he knows the true intentions. So now he goes out. Well, let me tell you, if those guys are there, Lot's not going out the front door. They're gone. Okay, they're disoriented. They are gone. They've dispersed. So now Lot goes out that evening and spoke unto his sons-in-law. So he had two son-in-laws because his daughters had married. So we know he had two son-in-laws. Other than that, we do not see Lot here speaking to anybody. It says, which married his daughters and said, Up! Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. So he's talking to his two son-in-laws. Now, why they aren't there, I'm not going to assume anything. They were not there. It says he went out. Now, I don't know if he went out of the room. Let me back up. If he went upstairs, if they were residing there with him, or next door in their own houses... But he went out to talk to him, it says, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-laws. His son-in-law says, you're joking. You can't be serious, father-in-law. They rejected Lot's offer, and they thought it was in jest. They would not accept his word as genuine that evening or morning. Verse 15 
must have been evening. Verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So they're telling him, Now, up, move, we're out of here. <laughs> and while he lingered, so here, now Lot's lingering. Okay, or he dallied around, Pastor put here. I don't know if I'd use the word dallied, but Lot did. He dallied around. It said, at this point, here's what happened in verse 16. And the men laid hold on his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. So now, the two angels have Lot, his wife, his two daughters in hand. The Lord being merciful unto him. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. And they brought him forth and set him without the city or outside the city. So now they've got him outside the city. Lot, his two daughters, and his wife. So there's four of them outside the city. Everybody else is in the city. And it came to pass... When they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Basically, the two angels told Lot, his wife, and his two daughters to flee the whole area, that whole plain area. Because the whole plain area was going to be destroyed. And he told him to get up in the mountains, which is probably a little ways away. But it was true. Oh, by the way, too, when I mentioned earlier, from where the angels came, the chapter before, and told Sarah and Abraham they were going to have a child, it was about 25 miles from where Abraham was down to Sodom, down the plain, about 25 miles. So keep that in mind. And it came to pass, they brought him forth, got him outside. Verse 18, And Lot said, Oh, not so, my Lord. Can you imagine negotiating the orders of your escape? Lot says, I don't want to go to the mountains. Okay, Lot, <laughs> I'm just, it was a little amusing here, but it really was not amusing. But, because I'm reading, I'm just reading from Pastor's notes. Okay. Can you imagine negotiating with God and your safety? Wow. But, here's Lot, he asks, it's not so, my Lord. Verse 19, Behold now thy servant, hath, if he if, if has found grace in your sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. I'm not sure what evil he was talking about, but he goes on and said, Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. Oh, let me escape hither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So he is negotiating. He's saying, can you not destroy all the plain? Can you let me go to this little city where I can escape? And will that be okay? And, he, and he's, he's pleading with them. Maybe he's praying. It says, he said, you, I have found grace in your sight. I've magnified. You've been magnifying me by your mercy. You've saved me. Um, I think this little town is safer. I won't have to go as far. There was, something he, there was something he said. There was something evil in the mountain. or I don't know if it was too far. Or he figured he couldn't make it with his wife and his two daughters. You know, one man and three women. I'm not sure exactly what was going through his mind here. But... Lot knew that his life was going to be spared. And so he takes advantage of the mercy that God was showing him 
to save his life, and he wants to go somewhere else. doesn't want to go to the mountain. Let's look at verse 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee. This is, the, this is the angel now. This is the angel speaking in verse 21. I have accepted thee concerning this thing also. Apparently what's happened, they have accepted what, what Lot has offered. And I will not overthrow this city. In other words, the city that Lot is going to go to. For the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee hither, for I cannot. This is, this is one of the angels speaking here. I cannot do anything till thou come hither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Now, Zoar means a small, tiny place. Names mean things. We'll, we'll, we'll see some of that. But Zoar meant a small, tiny place. So the, the angel makes it very clear here that Lot will be protected and that Zoar is accepted for his escape city. So the angel makes that real clear here. So now the sun said, verse 23, the sun was risen on the earth when Lot entered Zoar. So risen on the earth, so it was late morning, noon, sometime in there. Verse 24, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that grew upon the ground. Some say, and I'm going off of a man much smarter than me that wrote this, okay, which is Pastor Grimwood, it says here, the area had many asphalt pits, deposits of natural gas, um, um, uh, and amounts of sulfur. An earthquake may have been released. That could have released some of this. And fires. The ensuing explosion hurled flaming asphalt skyward. Another note here, right here, that... Um, the term becomes, it says here, for the word in the Old Testament, overthrew those cities, a catastrophe, a major catastrophe happened on the plains there. In other words, they were totally, totally, totally destroyed, that whole area, except for this little city of Zoar. Because you remember, Lot was still in the area, but he was a ways away. Many say that Zoar, pastor's gotten in his notes here, is from somewhere between three... Uh, excuse me, let me read it, the Dead Sea, da, da, da. Somewhere four to five to maybe six miles away from Sodom. Um, definitely not, was not sure. So they're destroyed. Verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now, let's define this here. She didn't turn into salt that we eat. Okay, it wasn't, a, it wasn't salt. Because, you know, salt would not stay in a pillar. You, if we redefine this here and look back into the Greek and Hebrew, pastors got here, she became as a pillar of salt. Whatever reason, she's history. Because she disobeyed the word that was given don't look back. She did. And she paid the price. So she became as a pillar of salt. Verse 27. Now we're shifting gears. So Sodom has been destroyed. His wife's a pillar of salt. They are in Zoar. Lot and his two daughters now. So here's the picture so far. Next verse switches over to Abraham. Look at verse 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Anybody ever wonder what that place was? And why did Abraham get up early? I believe Abraham knew what was happening. I believe Abraham knew that maybe why those two angels were there and where they were heading. 
And he knew where his nephew was, and his family, and his flocks, and his herds, and his herdsmen. And the place, you want know, to know what that place was? Remember back in Genesis earlier, when Abraham said to Lot, this is too great for us. We can't be bickering like this. We have to split. I think this place might have been a place that maybe Abraham often might have went. But he went to that place that morning, and in verse 28, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. So I think Lot, or Abraham might have gotten up quite a bit, and I bet you anything that Abraham prayed for Lot because he went and rescued Lot. And he rescued everybody else that had been taken away from those kings. But that morning he got up and looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, it says here in verse 28, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. The pastor put in the word smelting furnace. So all Lot saw that day wasn't a well-watered plain. He saw, he saw destruction. He saw smoke and flame and fire coming up out of the valley. Verse 29. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar. Wait a minute, I thought Lot wanted to go to Zoar. Now in verse 30, we see Lot leaving Zoar. Why did he leave Zoar? I've always asked myself that question. Thank you, Lord, for what Pastor put down here. It says here, He left Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. So now he ends it up where he was told to go originally, up in the mountains. And he has two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Because Zoar, remember, he was in the well-watered plain. I bet you Zoar was pretty much almost as wicked as Sodom was. And he said, I'm not staying here with my two daughters. I've already lost my wife. God has delivered me. I'm out of here. So now he's up in the mountains in a cave. So now he's in the cave there. And his firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old. There's not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Because they had their two husbands. Well, they decided to stay in Sodom. So they aren't around. Probably there's not a lot of men around. Probably there's very few. Probably there's, maybe there's no men around other than Daddy Lot. So now his two daughters are thinking the most important thing in life for a woman to do at that time and still today, thank you Jesus for women, that they said, we have got to keep our seed going. How are we going to do this? Now I'm not, what they did here was not good. It was incestuous. It was bad. But they were thinking of preserving seed and keeping a name going. So quickly here, many know the story. It said, come let us make our father drink wine. Pastor's got a note here. Drunkenness is never, 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 never good. But that night they made the Abraham get drunk. That we may preserve our seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and lay with her father, until he and he perceived not when she lay down with him, nor when she arose. And it came to pass the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday with my father. Let us make him drink wine again tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we might preser pre preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the younger arose, lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus, verse 36, were both of the daughters of Lot with child by their father. So their mission was accomplished. 
right or wrong, incestuous, wrong, never right. God condemned that later in Scripture, and I could take you back into Scripture there. But they did what they felt they needed to do to preserve their seed. Totally wrong, and you'll see why in a minute, to the two children that were born to them. And the, and the firstborn, verse 37, bare a son, called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. Moab means from the father. My child Moab came from my father. So she named him Moab. The Moabites, as you know throughout Scripture, were not friends of the Jews, were they? No. Let's see what the second child was. Verse 38. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. Which means, Ben-Ami means son of my people. So the first one was the, from the father. The second one was the son of my people. So they both named the children appropriately. Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. And how good were the Ammonites to the Israelites? We know that from Scripture. So what can we get from this as we wrap up this last three minutes here? How could this happen to Lot? He was with a godly man. He was under godly influence. How could this happen? How could this whole thing happen? It's a sad, sad thing. Almost made me want to cry as I looked. 2 Peter 2, 6-8. I'm going to take you there real quick. It says this. And turning the cities, this is verses 6 through 8, New King James Version. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to all those who afterward would live ungodly. You want to live an ungodly life? Here's an example. There's one, verse 7 and delivered righteous Lot. Lot was a righteous man. Despite of the pressures of his surroundings, and he caved into most of those pressures, but he was still a righteous, godly man who loved Jesus. He loved the Lord. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them this is what it did a lot. Tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. There's the reason. Three responses here. Number one, we could look at our own lives. We could see the concept. I've heard many people say today, my face private. I'm going to keep it all to me. And so they live in a shell. It's a sad thing. Why don't you want to share the greatest story you've ever got from your soul, from your life? But many people think like that today. They have a private faith. Two, the influence of a perverse daily environment. Where do you live every day? We live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked world of sin, of depravity. Our own hearts are even wicked. God tells us in his word, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God can. And God can change that heart. And so we see here that despite our environment, do not let your environment dictate your godly life. And do not let others pressure you into something you know is wrong. Three. Lot had an inability. Another sad thing we see here. Only three people came with him out of the city and they had to drag those three out and drag Lot out. Lot didn't have the ability, nor did he, 
to anyone to pass on his faith. You want to keep your faith private? That's between you and the Lord. But I don't think you're following a biblical example of what he wants us to do with our faith today. He wants us to share our faith, to live our lives, to be godly, to set an example so that the world, because some say that the only God somebody might ever see is you. And, some, and then there's another saying, the only, the things you do speak so loudly I can't hear what you say. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything other than live a godly life. So that's the challenge I got from the Lord, and hopefully that was a blessing to you tonight. I know it was some heavy stuff, but thank God that we have a merciful God that loves us unconditionally, and He spares us, and He died for us. And as Dave said this morning, He loves us, and I'm looking forward to the series that Dave continues on the love of God. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you again for this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths. Continue to lead us. Help us to grow in you, I pray. In your name, amen.